how many of you guys know what superbugs are or have heard the term superbugs? Today, what we're going to do is, is basically talk about superbugs. What they are, what are superbugs, how they have developed. So I'm going to kind of really go and educate you on how they have come about. They've never, they haven't always been around, but they are now. And we're going to talk about why we should be concerned about that and then how to conquer them or how to keep ourselves healthy and how to treat them once we have the superbug or if we're diagnosed, if we know we're diagnosed with the superbug. And then we'll have uh, time for questions. If you have questions along, please, this is a small group, please raise your hands and ask your question. I'd be more than happy to, you know, to go off on, you know, little tangents if you have questions that are about what we're talking about. Okay, so before I start talking about superbugs, I want to make a couple of um, digressions to start. The first thing I want to point out is what is an upper respiratory infection? I'm sure most all of us have had upper respiratory infections before. Probably one of the itises listed below, sinusitis, pharyngitis, which is inflammation of your throat, bronchitis, and otitis media, which just means inflammation of the middle ear. So all of those are considered upper respiratory infections. Or an upper respiratory infection does not include pneumonia. Pneumonia is more lower re respiratory infection. Uh, oh gosh, well this didn't come out. It's not showing up on the screen, but it's showing up here. Who knows what itis means? Basically inflammation. So itis does not always mean it's an infection. Okay, so that's the point I want to make out. So if you have inflammation in an area, it does not always mean infection. It means inflammation. There could be other allergens. There could be other environmental toxins causing the itis. So itis just means inflammation. And I'm sorry that it's not showing up on the screen. It's probably printed on your handout, though. I don't know why it's not on the screen. Okay, and it does not always mean bacterial infection. So if your doctor tells you you have bronchitis, it doesn't necessarily mean you need an antibiotic. A lot of times people just have that um, idea that that's what they need, okay? <clears throat> but they're not always bacterial infections. The good news, let's see, why is this not moving? Oh, here it comes. There it is. I, I had this is set up wrong, okay. So the good news is we have antibi antibiotics. So antibiotics kill bacteria. They're not used for all infections. They're mainly used for bacterial infections. Okay, and these are some of the, the diagnoses that we want to use antibiotics for. So strep throat caused by the strep bacteria. Scarlet fever and rheumatic fever are also related to the same strep bacteria. Chronic sinus infections, pneumonia, bladder infections, chlamydia, syphilis, and gonorrhea are some infections that we always would want to use antibiotics. But let's talk about how antibiotics work. I want to explain how they work so you can understand how superbugs have formed, okay? So antibiotics. Antibiotic means antibacteria, okay? It breaks down the cell walls of the bacteria. So basically, the, the bacteria cannot replicate anymore. So that's what the antibiotic is doing. It's not helping your immune system, really. Um, it's just addressing the bacteria. With viruses, there is no effect. So if you have a virus and you take an antibiotic, it's not going to help it, okay? Sometimes you think it is because your body is getting rid of the infection anyway but it will not help a virus. Okay, another point to, to talk about antibiotics is they take time to work, okay? So day one, your antibiotics are prescribed. By day five, it'll knock out some of the bacteria, and if you look at the picture, it's gonna knock out the weakest ones. The, the, the yellow one with the R, it just, re just represents the resistance ones, or the ones that are really strong, okay? So just like everything, you have really strong bacteria and you have really weak bacteria. The weak ones are gonna be killed off first. So if you take your antibiotic for just the five days, you kill off the weak ones, you leave the strong ones there, okay? So you wanna take your antibiotic, if you're on antibiotic, you wanna take it for the full 10 days or whatever the doctor has prescribed for you to take it, okay? 
Antibiotics, again, do not help colds or flus. Most upper respiratory infections that I told you about, remember the bronchitis, the sinusitis, um, they're caused by viruses, the majority of them. They do not help, they do not help colds and flus. So my point, the reason I'm explaining all this is because overusing the antibiotics is what's causing them to be ineffective against bacteria. Okay, so when you take antibiotics for colds and flus, they lose their effectiveness for bacteria infections, and that's called antibiotic resistance. So when a bacteria is resistant to antibiotics, it becomes what we call a superbug. So that's what superbugs are. Superbugs now, antibiotics do not help them. It doesn't mean they're any more dangerous. It doesn't mean because you get an antibiotic resistant infection it's going to be more dangerous. It just means that the antibiotics won't work, but it can be more dangerous in some situations. So I'm going I'm to explain that. Um, let's see. So over time the bacteria develop the ability to, to survive the treatment. So it's kind of like natural selection. It's, it's Darwin's theory, survival of the fittest. Like I said, you, the, the stronger ones are going to survive and replicate, and those are the ones that are resistant to the bacteria. Okay, so when, you're, when we constantly use antibiotics for viral infections, when we quit them too soon, like I just talked about, when we're using broad spectrum antibiotics when it's not necessary, and the antibiotic, antibiotics used in our livestock are all reasons why these superbugs are being created. So let me talk about some scenarios and examples, because this will help you understand a little bit better. So here's scenario number one. Jane has a sore throat. Without testing her, the healthcare provider prescribes penicillin, okay, just in case it's strep, okay? Jane's symptoms are actually caused by a virus. She doesn't, her symptoms are not caused by uh, an infection of strep. But Jane does have bacteria in her sinuses at the same time, and we all do. So when she takes the antibiotic, those bacteria that are in her sinuses will become resistant to the antibiotic over time, okay? So Jane takes the penicillin, all the bacteria are killed off, and the few hardy ones, remember, the ones that are the strongest, are left behind. And those survivors can withstand penicillin. And those are the ones now that are replicating. Okay, so the strongest ones are replicating. And now treatment is not effective. And Jane is now a carrier of penicillin resistant bacteria. So now she's a carrier of it. Okay? Right, because a lot of these infections, what people don't realize, a lot of these bacteria are what we call are naturally occurring flora in our bodies. It's only when our bodies become susceptible that they become infectious. A lot of these bacteria are in our sinuses, like staph. Staph is on our skin, it's in certain areas. Um, it's only when our, our, our bodies become um, weakened and susceptible that they become infectious. And so that's, that's, that's the problem. So when you have a virus and you take an antibiotic, all the bacteria that are on you, if they're constantly being exposed to that, they're gonna develop resistance, okay? So you might be exposed to her, and she might have more susceptible immune system and actually become infectious to her, okay? So. so the bad bacteria are getting out of control. Yeah, the resistance one, the, 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 the survivors. Right? Yeah, they have the ability to adapt. So they, through natural selection, the ones that are resistant to the bacteria are the ones that are surviving, but the antibiotics are the ones that are surviving, okay? So scenario number two. So that's, so unnecessarily using the antibiotic is leading to antibiotic resistant infection. So this has happened over time, so remember that. Another scenario is little girl Ashley comes home with a sore throat and fever and she has a positive strep test, so they go ahead and give her penicillin. So Ashley takes her medicine for three days. She feels fine after three days, and so her, her parents are saying, uh, decide to say it's okay to stop the antibiotic after the three days. So there's day one, there's some, there's some very strong ones in there, and she takes it for three days. Her symptoms are improved, so she stops. 
but some of them are still there. They're not causing the infection, but they're still there. They're not causing the symptoms, okay? The survivors multiply, and then there becomes resistant bacteria that she's carrying. So now she's a carrier of the resistant, the antibiotic resistant bacteria. So that's incomplete treatment causes resistance. So we talked about unnecessary treatment and incomplete treatment can cause resistance. So once, you, so resistance infections, if the, we're going to talk about how the immune system can actually take care of these. Like you asked, do you really need antibiotics all the time? But some people already have immune problems and these infections be, can become more dangerous, the resistance one. You're going to need higher dosage. So you're going to need on a lot, a lot higher dosage of antibiotics if you have a resistant infection. Longer treatments. You're going to need more expensive medications, more broad spectrum medications, and IV, possible IV, IV vancomycin and, and hospitalization. Now the problem with that is, is you're going to more likely have toxicity because of the medications, because you're having to take much stronger medications, they're more contagious. And they can pass, they can actually pass their resistance to other organisms, supposedly. So the worst case scenario is that infection may become resistant to all medications or untreatable. So untreatable by meds, not untreatable by helping your immune system fight it on its own. So we're going to talk about that on how to conquer superbugs in just a moment. Okay. So there was a study done on, they actually, they did a full blown out study on this, why we use why we overuse antibiotics, and these are the reasons why we overuse antibiotics. So it's, it's the patient's fault as well as the physician's fault, okay? It's, it's, it's both of our faults. So um, one of the reasons patients, for some reason, still have this idea that thick green nasal discharge always means bacterial infection, and that's not true. That's not a true statement, it does not always mean bacterial infections. Patients want to go back to work, you know, they want to go back to school. There's you know, unrealistic expectations on us. We shouldn't miss work. You know, we, want, we, we expect to go back to work the next day instead of actually taking the time we need to let our bodies heal. And that's both the patient's fault as well as just our society's um, problem. And a lot of patients just expect antibiotics. You know, I hear it all the time. A Z-Pact worked last time. Just give me a Z-Pact so I can get back to work. Um, a lot of times it's a virus and it's just more of a placebo effect than anything. Um, then physicians. Physicians think that patients expect the antibiotics. They don't want to make their patients mad. They want to um, satisfy their patients, so they give them an antibiotic. And diagnosis is difficult. You know, it's, patients want to know, well, what is causing it? What is, it's some sort of virus. It's a cold virus. We, you know, we don't always know what it is. We, but we, you know, we know that your body can handle it, and what the physician um, should do is educate more. And so we're going to talk about that in a minute. And then time pressure. You know, doctors don't have a lot of time to spend with their patients. They don't have the time. We do here, but most conventional doctors don't have the time to sit and explain the diagnosis so that the patient understands and feels satisfied and um, understands why he wouldn't prescribe the antibiotic. Okay? <clears throat> so, what, so what can patients do? Ask. Ask your healthcare provider to explain the diagnosis. Don't insist on antibiotics. And the reality is a lot of us do. And mainly because we think they're going to get us better more quickly, and that's not necessarily true. And always remember that most respiratory symptoms are caused by viruses. They're not always bacterial infections and don't always need antibiotics. They won't make you better any faster most of the time. And green or yellow mucus does not mean bacteria. You can have green mucus and it be a flu virus. So. Just always remember that. Wash your hands, of course. That's what patients can do. And also, be realistic. It takes a lot of time to get over a virus. We're not, there's super bugs out there, but there's no superhumans. Um, this is a, a chart that I got out of the Journal of American Medicine. And um, one of the, I guess I copied it, one of the, um, one of the lines didn't show up on it. I apologize about that, the one about cough. But, but realistically, it's going to take 14 to, to anywhere from two to three weeks to get over a cough, post-viral cough. So if you have a cough after a flu or a cold, it's not all that abnormal to cough for two weeks after you've had it. The fever should be gone within four to five days. 
and the, the sore throat should be gone within four days, but the real, realistically, a virus will last that long. Just because you're still coughing at eight days doesn't necessarily mean now you need an antibiotic or your body's still trying to get rid of it, still trying to heal at that point. You cough because you're getting rid of mucus in your lungs. Your body secretes mucus to catch the virus and then the body wants to get it out. That's your body trying to heal. Well, I mean, a fever, if you look on here, the average fever, it'll, you know, most cases with a virus um, should be gone within four days. Should be gone within four days. Some viruses, you don't run a fever. A lot of colds, you're not going to run a fever. Okay? Just a, just a normal cold. But it can last up to two weeks. So what can healthcare providers do? Take time to explain the diagnosis. Ask patients about their expectations. And um, treat conservatively. Um, I do hear every now and then that a patient comes in and says, well, my doctor wouldn't give me an antibiotic. And I look at them and I say, you have a really good doctor. You, know, you didn't need it. You didn't need that antibiotic. I mean, there are certain cases where it would be a good idea, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But, um, you know, the, the doctor is well trained to know when an antibiotic needs to be used and, and when it doesn't necessarily need to be used. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some of the common complaints of why we get antibiotics. Sore throats. A lot of times. 90% of sore throats are viruses. They're not, it's not a strep. Um, if it is a strep, you, I would recommend doing a rapid strep test, but this is what you're going to see if it's a strep. You're not going to see the cough. Strep infections, there's no cough. That's usually allergies or a cold. You're going to have a fever and swollen glands, and you're going to have discharge from your tonsils. If you just have a little red throat and it's sore and you're, you have a cough and allergy type symptoms, it's probably a cold or some sort of allergy. So just remember that sore throats are normally viruses, okay? Very rarely, not a lot of times it's strep, but 90% are viruses. If you're going to use an antibiotic, penicillin or amoxicillin or something like that is recommended for, for strep. I wouldn't do a broad spectrum antibiotic, okay? You want to try not to use the broad spectrum ones if you can go without it. I'm going to tell you about how to treat it naturally in just a minute, but this is kind of going through the conventional stuff first. When you say broad spectrum, what do you mean? Um, you know, um, penicillins are more for the gram-positive bacteria. You have all different kinds of bacteria, gram-negative, gram-positive. Broad spectrum means it's going to just basically wipe out everything, okay? So, um, and you want to try to avoid those if you can, because you need bacteria in your, in your on your body, in your body. You have more bacteria in your body than you have cell, more bacteria on and in your body than you have cells. So they're very important. They do a lot of important things for us. Okay, ear infections. This is a very common one. Most ear infections, if you're over two years old, treatment should be wait and see for three days. Um, unless there's bulging yellow-red eardrum or there's a lot of pain behind the ear, things like that, most of your ear infections will be um, resolved within three days, even without treatment. Um, but there are times when you might want to use an antibiotic in certain children in, in certain instances. But usually the wait and see tactic for three days should be done first. Okay, and amoxicillin is the um, antibiotic of choice for ear infections, which is just another form of penicillin, like penicillin. Sinusitis, that's inflammation within the sinuses and the nose. Um, again, yellow-green mucus does not mean bacterial infection. Usually antibiotics, you want to think about them if you have um, more than 10 days of severe symptoms, like a very high fever, facial pain on one side, post-nasal drip, and swelling around the eyes, not just a little bit of puffiness, but real swelling, you're going to want to think about an antibiotic at that point, okay? Moxicillin, antibiotic of choice. So cough illness, bronchitis, a lot of times for some reason people think bronchitis is, means a horrible infection or a bacterial infection, but usually it's caused by viruses as well. They can last two to three weeks. Again, especially the cough usually lasts a good three weeks after. Um, and antibiotic treatment will not necessarily prevent pneumonia. Sometimes um, it's thought that if I start antibiotics early, it'll prevent pneumonia, and that's not always the case. So the reason, so what are the most common superbugs? Now, the reason we have superbugs, again, let's review that, is we're overusing antibiotics. We think we always need an antibiotic. We forgot that we have immune systems that can help the infection on its 
without the antibiotic. Um, once we start an antibiotic, we're stopping it early. So I always tell patients, if, if they've already started, go through the whole course of the antibiotic. Don't stop it early, okay, because that can cause the resistance. And um, so those, and then also, I, I'm not going to talk much about it, but the antibiotic use in our livestock and our meats and stuff like that are also causing some problems with our bacteria becoming resistant to antibiotics. So I'm not going to talk much about that, but that's another, um, another issue that's causing it. So what's the most common superbug you've all heard of? MRSA, MRSA, right. There are a lot. I've, I didn't realize how many superbugs there were when I was doing, reading up about all the, the common superbugs. But MRSA is the most um, um, common one. It's just uh, uh, methicillin resistant staph aureus. So you've heard of staph infections, right? So it's just a staph infection that's, resistance to, that's resistant to antibiotics. The, um, the penicillin antibiotics, basically, okay? So a lot of times people hear MRSA and they think it's gonna be more, it is more dangerous in effect that if it gets into a person that's immune suppressed, it can cause a lot of problems. Um, sometimes you might have a staph infection and not realize it's MRSA because your body um, handled it on its own. But MRSA is the most common. It can lead to abscesses. So more, more skin problems, skin abscesses, necrotizing fasciitis, um, flesh-eating diseases, things like that. Um, I had a, you know, a friend here locally that was in the hospital. He had a MRSA infection in his arm. Had to have IV vancomycin because they couldn't get it under control. Um, but the CDC in 2005 alone reported 18,650 deaths in the hospital due to MRSA. Most of these are occurring more in the hospitals, but now you're seeing it more in communities and um, in, in other places. Because hospitals are where antibiotics are used most. Okay, so MRSA okay. is the most important one. Strep, strep, streptococcus pneumonia. It's, this is all, like I said, this is this is one that's found in the respiratory tract of most every person. Um, when the immune system becomes compromised, that's when it turns pathogenic. Okay, so a lot of these, so that, that raises the question, is it the bacteria or is it the, is it the, the person's body and the immune, the lack there of immune response that's causing the, the infection? So strep pneumonia is going to cause pneumonia, can cause meningitis, pericarditis, um, brain abscesses, osteomyelitis, which is inflammation of the bone. So that's one that's become resistant to antibiotics as well. Okay, there's a whole bunch. I'm not going to go over every one because I want to talk about um, how to treat these and how to prevent them. Um, Pseudomonas, Clostridium difficile is a big one. A lot of, a lot of people, I've had, a lot, I've had quite a few patients with um, resistant Clostridium difficile from being in the hospital, that they've come here and that we had to do IVs and stuff like that, and it's been very helpful. But that's the one that causes the, um, a lot of diarrhea, a lot of problems in the bowels, mainly. Um, there are some I can't pronounce here. Acinetobacter, I'm not going to try. Mycobacterium tuberculosis, vancomycin resistant enter, enterococcus, which is another GI bug. Salmonella and E. coli even are becoming resistant to antibiotics. Okay? All right. So throughout, throughout all my, I said this already, but throughout all my readings and trying to prepare for and reading about these um, bacteria, I did a lot of reading, became very interested in it. Um, the common theme that I kept reading was when tissue is damaged or the immune system is not working. That's when these bugs become dangerous. Okay, so remember that. When tissue is damaged or the immune system is not working. So that's kind of what we, what we do here at the Reardon Clinic is we want to make sure that we keep our tissue from not being damaged and we want to make sure our immune, system, immune systems are always working well. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, you know, how to, how to do that in just a minute. Um, that's the most important thing to prevent these superbugs, to prevent any infection, but prevent these superbugs from happening within ourselves and to help treat them. Sometimes you might get an infection and you get over it so quickly, you didn't know it was one of the superbugs. Okay, your body can still um, get rid of it in the same way. So I just stated that this a second ago, but 
because of this common theme, I asked the question, is the bacteria the problem? Or is the real problem the terrain of the body that allows the infection of the bacteria to manifest? Or is it a combination of it both? But you have to remember that. Keep your body healthy and you're less likely to have these huge infections that occur, okay? You might have some symptoms because your body, you know your symptoms are your body trying to get well. A fever, a cough, mucus is your body. It's not the bug. That's your body attacking the bug to get rid of the bug, right? So it prevents it from getting in the bloodstream <coughs> and stuff. So you might have some minor symptoms, um, but the idea is so that your body can produce the symptom and get rid of the bug quickly, okay? So how do we treat superbugs? Stay healthy. How do you stay healthy? I'm going to talk about that in just, just a minute. Um, you know, three, three main points I'm going to go through. You hear it all the time, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Okay, wash your hands. Um, keep your skin healthy. Avoid immune suppressors. And strengthen the immune system with diet and lifestyle choices. Okay, so those are the three uh, little points I'm going to talk about today. Okay, so let's talk about skin. Be careful with antibacterial soap. Okay, a lot of people, um, the FDA has not determined, not that, well, I won't go there, but the FDA, FDA has not determined whether these soaps are more effective than regular soap. That has never been determined. And some doctors actually do not recommend using them. I would not recommend using them. For one, it's alcohol-based. Alcohol is just going to destroy and dry your skin out. All that protective <laughs> oils and everything on your skin is going to be dried out. And number two, it's going to kill all the susceptible bacteria. But if 99.9 percent .9 effective, but what about that 0.1? A lot of those are the real strong ones that can then start replicating and cause problems. So I wouldn't use antibacterial soap, hand sanitizers as well. All right, I drink water. I mean, unless you do not have access to soap and water, and you know, and you you have something on your hands that you need to wash, I would try not to use the hand sanitizers. Yes, sir? What you're saying is the antibacterial soap really doesn't do that much good? No. The question is, does the antibacterial soap do much good? I would say, I would say it's, it's not really determined, but my opinion is no. So keep your skin healthy. That's how you can keep your body from getting these <laughs> bugs. Um, and uh, also to help your body get over it more quickly. Because it's not, it's okay to get a virus. It's okay to get a bug. It's actually sometimes a good thing. But to help, but you want your body to, to get through it okay and get through it healthily. Okay? All right, so I just talked about this. The real key is um, soap and water, keeping your hands moisturized. I don't mean having to use a lot of lotions all the time. Lotions have a lot of toxins in them. But if you have a skin problem, you have dry skin or some sort of, underlying problem that's affecting your skin, work that up. Make sure there's nothing going on there. Probably a thyroid problem or vitamin deficiency, something going on there. Antioxidant-based lotions or oils would be probably best. I would avoid mineral oil, petroleum in products because it just creates a film over your pores and um, things can't get in and things can't get out. So it's not extremely healthy for your skin. So keep your skin healthy by avoiding that in products. Okay, so petroleum jelly, things like that. Okay. All right, so we don't want to weaken our immune system. So what habits weaken the immune system? Anybody want to guess? Eating or drinking 100 grams of sugar reduces the white blood cell's ability to kill germs by 40%. 100 grams of sugar, that's how many teaspoons? Shoot, I can't remember. I'm going to say. Four grams of a teaspoon. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think the average American eats something like 20 something teaspoons a day or, or more than that. So 40% decrease in the white blood cell's ability mm -hmm. to kill germs. So watch that. Um, being overweight or obese. Will, will decrease your white blood cells ability to multiply and produce antibodies and rush to the site of infection. So you have a very sluggish immune system the more overweight you are. So that's important. Drinking three or more drinks suppresses the ability of the white blood cells to multiply. 
okay, and help. So alcohol will, will certainly decrease the immune system's ability to, to function quickly, okay? So those are some habits. The most important is probably the sugar and what I'm going to talk about in just a minute, um, lack of antioxidants in the, in, the, in the diet. So let's kind of go through that. How much time do I have? All right, so let's talk about, before I talk about how to increase the immune system, let's talk about what the immune system is, okay? I want you to see uh, kind of how complex it is, pretty complex, amazing um, system in your body. So the first thing, there's five stages in the immune response. The first thing, you have macrophages that identify the invaders, okay? So any type of foreign invader, whether it's a bacteria, a virus, a toxin, um, a heavy metal, things like that. Macrophage, macrophage will identify the invader. You have these helper T cells that call for help, hence the name helper T cells. So I'm not going to go into detail, but these are just little steps. Then you have B cells that tag the invaders with antibodies. And then you have killer T cells, okay? They destroy the invader, they kill, they kill the invader. And then you have memory and T and B cells that remember the invaders. So that's how you get immunity to infection. So a lot of viruses um, and infections, once you have the infection, you're immune to it. You're, you have these helper T and B cells. So hopefully everything is working great in your system, okay? But that's the five stages of the immune response. So, how is the immune system weakened? Okay, so we talked about, well, I don't want to go back all the way. We talked about sugar and alcohol and being overweight weakens the immune system. But um, free radicals, have you ever heard that term before? Yes. Okay, free radicals, oxidants is another name, things that cause oxidative stress will weaken the immune system, okay? So, Basically, a free rad radical is just an unpaired electron, okay, that's running around in the body. And so we don't like these, um, these unpaired electrons are very unstable, and they'll take electrons from, um, you know, nearby molecules to help stable them. And you, usually it's, it's um, part of the immune system that is taking the electron from. So basically, all of the immune cells, all those five steps that we talked about are damaged by free radicals in the body. Okay, they lose electrons to the free radicals. And when they lose the, erect, the electrons, they lose the ability to communicate. So you, that's a very intelligent thing going on, those five steps I talked about. Very, very um, precise thing that's happening. And if they lose their electrons, things aren't communicating well. You know, your immune response is not proper. So you're, you're going to have a slow immune response or you're not going to do it properly. So you're going to be more susceptible to having a, um, a really bad infection, things going bad, where you need an antibiotic, okay? But we want to make sure all this is working so that you don't need an antibiotic, because guess what? A lot of these bugs are resistant now. So this is really what we need to focus on, is keeping this immune system working, well-oiled. Okay, so we don't want to talk about that. So how do you treat free radicals? Or how do you help your body not um, have all these free radicals running around stealing from your immune system? Or oxidants, what do you give them to get rid of oxidants? What do you give your body? You probably all have heard the term before. Antioxidants. Antioxidants, yay! <laughs> Antioxidants to the rescue. All right. So there's, antioxidants are an amazing thing, okay? It might be natural, but some of the most powerful things are the natural nature. Nature is more powerful than anything. Antibi antibiotics to the rescue. So antioxidants are a molecule capable of slowing or preventing the oxidation of other molecules, okay? So oxidation is a chemical reaction that transfers electrons from a substance to an oxidizing agent. I don't, I'm not gonna go into detail about that. Um, you don't want oxidation. You want a lot of antioxidants to prevent the oxidation from going on, okay? because the oxidation makes free radicals, okay? So what you want to do is take a lot of antioxidants, get a lot of antioxidants in your diet so that you don't have free radicals running around stealing from your immune system, okay? So you want to take antioxidants, but at the same time, you want to avoid things that cause damage to your body, okay? So a lot of the sugar, 
a lot of chemicals. I didn't talk about that, but chemical exposures, food additives. I could go on for days about that. But antioxidants is key to keeping the immune system healthy. That's why you hear vitamin C helps the immune system. Zinc helps the immune system. They're all antioxidants, okay? So how do we boost the immune system through nutrition? Vitamin C, one of the most famous antioxidants. We do a lot of vitamin C here. We do vitamin C IVs here. But it reduces DNA damage in immune cells. So if there's DNA damage, the immune cell can't replicate properly, can't work well. So a lot of vitamin C is very, very important. Um, so there's a bunch of sources of vitamin C. So basic, but really, um, berries, cantaloupe, people think oranges. Oranges are not really the highest in vitamin C. Chili peppers and bell peppers are probably the highest in vitamin C. So making sure you get lots of antioxidants in your diet is key to keeping your immune system healthy, okay? And I don't mean one piece of fruit a couple times a week. You know, you need a lot of antioxidants. I, I want to say 10 to 12 servings of vegetables and fruit, preferably vegetables more, a day is ideal, okay? Finding ways to get that many in. Boosting, so vitamin E is a very, very important antioxidant. It protects cellular membranes. It's a fat-soluble vitamin. It keeps the cell membranes healthy. If the cell membranes are healthy, then communication works well, immune system works well. So vitamin E is very important. And these are um, some vitamin E foods. This is just for your information. Mustard and turnip greens. You guys don't eat a lot of that here in Kansas. We do in South Louisiana. Nuts, spinach, broccoli, carrots, sunflower seeds, everything that's natural, everything that is nature made, God made, whatever you want to call it. Okay? Man made, mm, not very high in antioxidants. So, other great antioxidants, B6 and B12, has a huge, um, considerable influence on the immune system as well as the liver and detoxification. So, these are some sources of B6 and B12. So you can read through that, that later. So diet is extremely important to keep you healthy. Vitamin A and vitamin D3, those are, are very important, okay, to keeping your body healthy. So vitamin D is the vitamin of the decade. Everyone knows about vitamin D. It comes from sunshine, okay. You have to have healthy skin, though to get enough vitamin D. So it's the UV lights hitting the cholesterol on your skin and that creates vitamin D, basically. Egg yolks, so all those people that leave out the egg yolks are losing out on vitamin D. Sardines, great source of vitamin D, and omega-3s as well, so eat your sardines. All right, so there's a lot of other, you know, copper, zinc, zinc's extremely important for the immune system. Selenium is very important for the immune system. Those are all minerals. So a question I always get all the time is, can we get it just through food? Um, in, the, in the perfect world, I'd say yes, but now we're so toxic. We, most of us are already have some sort of chronic illness going on. I say supplement, supplement, supplement. Um, test your levels would be idea, ideal and then supplement or make sure you're getting foods with adequate amount of those nutrients. But especially when you're sick, you're going to need to supplement. I'm going to show you some examples of, um, you know, what I've done in the past with patients to, with supplements to help them through an illness. But um, it is my opinion that we, a lot of us really do need to supplement, at least to dig us out of the hole we're already in. So we're all so toxic. So another thing to remember is probiotics. Who's heard the term of probiotics? So that just means pro-life, right? Um, <clears throat> you need probiotics. Probi what's, did you, see, you have a question? Somebody have a question? No? Okay. So they're in yogurt. Not so much in the processed yogurts you get from the stores, especially the ones that are sugared. You know, like Yoplait, high in sugar, high in food dyes, things with like the, that. With the food at the bottom? Probably <laughs> not the best idea. Is the Greek any better than the normal? It's, it's, way, it's how it's processed. There's a little bit more protein in it. I don't know about probiotic. Kefir certainly has more probiotics, but I don't think Greek necessarily has more probiotics than the regular yogurt. I, I know it has more protein. Something how it's made, it goes through a cheesecloth a little differently or something. Um, 
But probiotics are very, very important for white blood cell production. You need the bacteria in your gut. They're actually a part of making your white blood cells. So that's extremely important to remember that. So if you're on antibiotics, always at least take a probiotic when you're on it at opposite times. But, um, so yogurt, aged cheese, buttermilk. My great grandmother lived to be 108 years old. She swore it was because they drank buttermilk. They drank buttermilk every day. That was just a normal practice. I don't know. Um, my dad drinks it, and he's outlived all the men in his family so far. So um, pickles, sauerkraut, and sourdough, sourdough bread apparently has a lot of probiotics. But usually when you're in a disease state, you're going to need to supplement. Okay? You've already killed off your bacteria, especially in this modern time. Okay? All right, so I want to re revisit scenario number two. You remember little Ashley? Ashley, she came home with school with a sore throat and a fever. Oh, shoot. And um, they did the positive strep test, and they prescribed her penicillin. Okay? Um, how else could scenario number two have been treated? That's, that's my point. You asked that. Do you, does, just because it's a positive strep test, would you need to <laughs> use an antibiotic? So I'm going to share a case with you. Actually, it happened on Monday. This was a case um, of my, actually my son. He's four years old. He um, was sent home from school with 102.8 fever, swollen glands, sore throat, uh, no cough. Um, physical exam, he had enlarged tonsils with the white um, pustules and the discharge. Um, classic case of strep throat. Classic case of strep throat. Um, my treatment plan for him, no food. He didn't have an appetite anyway. So the body's going to tell you, you know, don't eat. Lots of water, no fever reducers. The first thing a lot of parents want to do is, oh my gosh, I have a fever. Let's give him a fever reducer. Um, the fever helps kill the bacteria. So it can actually, if you let the fever happen, it can actually decrease the length of the infection. No fever reducers. And this is um, some of the dosages I gave him, just to give you an example. I always say, ask your doctor first before you dose it this way. Um, but I gave him 20,000 IUs of pure vitamin A, 10 of vitamin D, 20 CFUs of probiotics, 1,000 milligrams of C, and he went to sleep. He was tired. He went to sleep. You know, when you sleep, that's when your immune system is active. That's when your body's repairing. That's, when, that's why you want to sleep when you're sick most of the time. Um, he, woke up with, he woke up from that with 99.2 fever and full of energy. <clears throat> Pustules were completely gone, although his throat was still injected. His throat was red and swollen, and he, he told me he had a tiny bit of a sore throat. Um, I gave him more, another dose. Two hours later, he had no fever, and he said his, and his throat looked normal at that point. Um, I, vitamins were given again. Actually, I didn't because I finished the slide. About four hours later, he ran another 100 fever for about an hour, and he slept. He took another nap, slept for about an hour. And then he woke up and his fever was fine. He's been fine since. Um, but I keep giving that same dosage twice a day for two days after he's well. You always keep, keep um, what's the word I want to use? Stimulating the immune system even after you're well. Okay? Um, so that's what I've given him. He's been fine, no problems, no amoxicillin was given or anything. So um, that's just an example. You know, um, I felt comfortable doing that. You know, I know what to look for if there are any problems. But most of the time, children, especially if they're healthy, they're going to get over it just fine. Um, but at the same time, I will admit, you know, I was like, oh, I got to get back to work. You know, what if I had to? You know, with with childcare, you have to take. They can't go back to school for 24 hours anyway. So I was like, whatever. I'll take the day off work. I took the day off work. It's probably the best day I've had in a long time. Got to rest. I got to go to the store when things were actually open and when the weekend. Um, you know, so, you know, I did go through that whole mental thing that patients go through. Oh, I got to get back to work. You know, I want to get better as quickly as possible. But I had to remind myself, you know, this is, this is kind of good for him. This is good for his immune system. He probably needed to rest. He probably needed a day home. And he needed this. And so just remember that. And he just he got over it just fine. Just fine. So what do I do if I become infected with a superbug? You might not even know you're infected with a superbug. I mean, he could have had a superbug. I, I don't know. I mean, his immune system, you know, took care of it just, just fine. Can the immune system fight superbugs? Yes. It's really no different. It's just resistant to the antibiotics. It's not resistant to your immune system. Okay? Oh, so here's my... 
Um, why do I become, what do I do if I become infected with a superbug? Stay cal keep calm. And yes, yes, yes. Um, anyway, it's kind of a joke. Uh, so how does your immune system fight superbugs? The same exact way it fights non-superbugs. Remember those five steps? It's going to do the same thing. Okay, so your body can fight it. Uh, if there's a fever, don't eat. Give your GI tract some rest. Keep boosting your immune system through nutrition. So good foods and supplements, uh, essential oils. There's a lot of other things. If patients already have dampened immune systems or they're not getting well more quickly, we've done, we do UV blood irradiation for, I had um, several staph MRSA infections where we did the UV blood irradiation very successfully. We combined it with IV antioxidants, IV vitamin C. Worked very, very well. Uh, didn't need the IV vancomycin. Um, and there's other, there's, uh, there's a lot of other natural treatments that you can, that you can go to first. Like uh, I had another patient with a topical staph MRSA, it was diagnosed as MRSA. <clears throat> and we actually did the um, bentonite clay, turmeric, and manuka honey combination. And um, bentonite clay will draw the infection out, turmeric's an anti-inflammatory, and the manuka honey is an an basically an antibiotic. Worked very well for that case. Those are some other examples. Apple cider vinegar and baking soda has been used. I personally haven't used that with any patients. I've had people tell me it works very well, but there are a lot of other um, essential oils that are fantastic with helping with infections. So, you know, normally if no improvements are seen, then you begin IV vitamin C or ultraviolet light therapy, you know, or you can be hospitalized with vancomycin. But even then, sometimes the vancomycin, I mean, you're in the hospital for weeks. Trying to, trying to get rid of that infection. <clears throat> so um, there's a couple of the points I wanted to make. I, I think I've already stressed this, but you know, we want to prevent illnesses. We want to keep healthy, but we at the same time want to remember that it's completely realistic for us to get viruses sometimes. And I really think it's important for our immune systems to get the viruses. It kind of helps wake them up. It helps um, keep the immune system healthy. and. Um, you know, so there's a lot of other research going on with viruses and what it does for our body. So <clears throat> they're using them to treat cancers. Supposedly they can infect cancer very well and help the immune system fight cancer. So there's, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, intelligence to it that we're not aware of. So instead of f trying to fight these bugs all the time, let's help our bodies do it on its own. Okay, so let's keep our bodies healthy so that, you know, our immune system can work the way it was intended and get through the infection. The take-home the take is that nature is way more powerful than science. Science is, you know, science is us humans manipulating nature in a lab. You know, think of the most powerful things on this earth, tornadoes, earthquakes. I mean, nature is pretty powerful, so never underestimate, you know, the power of what your body can do.